If you haven't done so yet, pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. We are asked to consider a cylindrical Gaussian surface with a particular radius that is coaxial with the x-axis. So we have drawn a Gaussian surface in the shape of a cylinder. It is indeed coaxial with the x-axis. And we know that there is an electric field in this region of space. The electric field is given by this equation right here. And what we will notice is that the electric field depends on the value of x. So this is a non-uniform electric field because it depends on x. It is variable. And the larger x is, the larger the electric field would be. So for instance, if you were looking over here at x is equal to 0, the electric field would have a particular value. But if you look at x equals 2, you would have a larger electric field. So if we were to draw some electric field vectors, we would have to draw more vectors pointing to the right at x equals 2 than we would at x equals 0, because again, the greater the value of x, the greater the magnitude of the electric field. We're pointing these vectors to the right because the electric field is equal to x plus 2. So all of these values of x in this region are positive. If we add a positive value of x to 2, we get a positive value, so the electric field points to the right. Now, that's the setup, but in A, we are asked a particular question. It says, what is the magnitude of the electric flux through the other end of the cylinder? And I think by other end, they were talking about the far right end over here. So we're asked to calculate the magnitude of the electric flux through the right end of the tube. And we have the electric field, and then we also have the definition of the electric flux. We can see that the electric flux is this integral of the dot product between the electric field and the so-called dA. Let's talk about dA. What is dA? Well, if we go to the right end of the cylinder, what we can do is we can imagine that there are these area vectors, and these area vectors always point away from the interior of the Gaussian surface. So the interior of the Gaussian surface is over here. We must point our dA vectors away from that interior. So for example, one of those dA vectors would be pointing to the right. And you'll notice that because dA points to the right and the electric field points to the right, that the angle between those two vectors is zero degrees. Now that becomes important because we can rewrite the electric flux by the following method. We recall that a dot product is equivalent to the magnitude of the electric field multiplied by the magnitude of dA and then multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. But as we just noted, the angle between these two vectors is zero degrees. The cosine of zero, of course, is one. So we can actually simplify the equation for electric flux to make it look like this. Next, we will sub in the variable electric field. So the electric field, again, was defined to be x plus two. And now what we want to do is talk about that x plus 2, that electric field expression. Now, we are interested in the electric flux through the far right end of this cylinder. Now, ask yourself, on the far right end of that cylinder, does the x value vary? In other words, if I were to select a point here or up here or in the middle, does the x value vary? And the answer is no. For all three of those points and many others between them, the x value would be a constant. It would be 2 meters. So since the x is a constant, you can factor out the expression x plus 2. It is constant at the far right end of the cylinder. Very good. So now we have the integration of dA, and the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to the far right end of the cylinder, we have these little patch elements, as the textbook calls them. There's a little square patch element here on the far right end. There's another little square patch element here. There's actually an infinite number, theoretically, of these little patch elements. And what we're supposed to do is sum the areas of those little square-shaped patch elements. That's actually what the integral of dA means. It means to take the sum of the areas of those infinite little patch elements. But of course, if we did that, we would just get the area of the far right end of the cylinder. So in other words, this integration of dA is just going to be the area of the far right end of the cylinder. Now, the far right end of the cylinder is a circle. So we can actually write the integration dA as the area of that circular end cap, which is pi times the radius squared. Now, we have everything we need. We know x is equal to 2 meters at that location. We also know that the radius of our cylinder is 20 centimeters. We just divide that by 100 to make it into meters. So let's go ahead and plug those values in. And when we simplify this, we get approximately 0.5. And the unit of electric flux is as follows. Remember, we're multiplying an electric field 
by an area. Electric field is newtons per coulomb, and area is meters squared. So this would be the correct answer to part A. That is the electric flux that's passing through the far right end of that cylindrical Gaussian surface. We can therefore move on to part B of the question, which says, well, what net charge is enclosed within the cylinder? So in order for us to get the net charge enclosed within the cylinder, we actually need to look at Gauss's law, which tells us that the enclosed charge, that is the charge enclosed in that Gaussian surface, is equal to this constant, epsilon naught, multiplied by the total electric flux. Now we have to be careful because we might naively think, well, gee, we just found the electric flux from part A, let's just plug that in and we'll be all set. But that was only the electric flux that was passing through the right end of the cylinder. We also have electric flux that's passing through the left end of the cylinder. So we're gonna actually have to go through and calculate that electric flux next. And we will do so by proceeding in a similar fashion to how we did earlier. So again, you go to the far left end of the cylinder, you draw a DA vector that's pointing away from the interior. So in this case, to the left. And then you ask yourself, well, what's the angle between the DA vector and the electric field vector? The electric field vector, recall, is pointing to the right in the positive x direction. The angle between those two vectors, of course, is 180 degrees. So when we go to calculate the flux through the left end of this cylindrical Gaussian surface, we're going to integrate and we're going to have electric field magnitude times DA magnitude times the cosine of 180. But the cosine of 180 is a negative 1. So that cosine 180 is a negative 1, which can be factored to the outside of the integral. Very good. Now, same idea as before. We're going to substitute our expression of x plus 2 for the electric field. And once again, x plus 2 is constant because on the far left end of the cylinder, the value of x is a constant 0. Again, same idea. Select any point on the far left end of that end cap and ask yourself, well, what's the x-coordinate of each of those points? And the x-coordinate of each of those points is indeed 0. So we can factor out the x plus 2 because it is a constant. And then we're left with the integration of dA. That is the sum of those little patch element areas. And we know that that's just the area of the left end cap, which of course is that circular area. So we're just gonna fill in pi r squared once again, and then we're gonna fill in the values. We know x is zero in this case, because we're on the far left end of that cylindrical Gaussian surface, and then the radius is the 0.2 meters. And when we compute that, we get roughly negative 0.25. And again, same unit here, we have newtons per meter, excuse me, newtons per coulomb times meters squared. So that's the flux to the left end. Now we're getting ready to do Gauss's law, but maybe some students out there are saying, well, what about the sides of the cylinder? Don't we have to take account for the flux through the sides of the cylinder? Well, let's take a look at one of the sides and you'll notice that the DA vector, again, pointing from the interior and perpendicular to the cylinder would be pointing straight up. The electric field in that vicinity is pointing to the right. Well, the angle between those two vectors would be 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 is zero. And so what that means is that the electric flux through the sides of the cylinder is actually zero, and therefore we don't need to take that into account. So for those students who are wondering about the flux through the sides, that would explain that we don't even need to consider that. Now we can calculate the enclosed charge because Gauss's law tells us that the constant epsilon multiplied by the total flux is going to equal the enclosed charge. All we need to do is make sure that for the total flux, we take the flux through the left end and add that to the flux through the right end. Remember the flux through the right end was obtained in part A of the question. So let's fill in the two fluxes along with the value of the constant epsilon. And when we plug that into our calculators and simplify, we will get approximately 2.22 times 10 to the minus 12. Dimensionally, we have filled in the unit of epsilon, and then here's the unit of flux. And if we multiply those out here a little bit together, we can see what we get. So this is Newton meter squared per coulomb. The Newton meter squareds cancel. Uh, a factor of coulomb cancels, leaving us with coulombs. As we expect for the unit of charge, this is indeed the correct answer to the question.